So here we are at Abbey Road in London. The M50, I want to show you the inside. So that's the Perspex, oh, wow. and that's the it's incredible. 12 millimeter diaphragm. All the works are inside. There's a valve in the middle. You're probably hard to see. Can where's, where's the valve? Show it to uh, Just put. Uh, oh, there, that yeah. little tiny thing there? That, that black thing, yes. So this is the. This is what Lester de described as the golf ball, the Perspex golf ball. Yeah, it is exactly. There's the it's tiny nice. diaphragm. Yeah. Half inch diaphragm. And this in there, lying sideways, is the is the valve, or as Americans would say, the tube. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't say tube, they say tube. <laughs> <laughs> and that gives such a wonderful result. I've never seen it inside one of these. No, no. Well, I thought you'd be pleased. I'm exceptionally pleased, yes. Yeah. It's gorgeous. They're very special, as you realise. And the 49, this is a brand new one, Type 49, number 1244 condenser microphone from Neumann. I've got a lot of spares. From, from the period? From the period, yes. And that looks like that. Is that so, gold or brass? It's gold splattered on mylar or some flexible membrane. And being double sided, you get your figure of eight or combine the voltages, you get to Omni. Amazing. That's nice to have laying around a spare capsule for an M49. <laughs> it is, yeah. In the old days, 1970, when I started, um, the things like this were sort of bought by the dozen at that time. And uh, that's what I found when I took over. What I found in the cupboard. So I haven't used any yet. And uh, You haven't need to use any yet? Not, not from the boxes, not these. They're just no. on show, really. So we're going to talk to the rather wonderful Mr. Lester Smith, who is the technical engineer here at Abbey Road. Mm -hmm. You started uh, here in 1970, but you spent a couple of years at Hayes. Mm. Um, I have notes as making pre-recorded commercial tapes for quarter-inch reel-to-reel consumer format. Is that mm. correct? Mm. Because uh, so many people in that era the 50s, 60s, and um, so on, loved to do home recording. And they had the chance of buying Beatle tapes or opera tapes a quarter inch in the market, the commercial market. And I was in the department that was making those commercial tapes. And we had 36 BTR2 tape machines. Each one holds a pancake of a tape which will produce about six um, at a time recordings and there was an um, a, a army of ladies who would come along and cut them up and leader them uh, red for end and white for start of the tape so and then box them so everyone knew what was what and, where, and the box had a, a pretty cover on it uh, inside the lid and there was a control room that a master control room that had the master tape that was uh, probably done on a one inch machine sent up from Hay sent up from Abbey Road to Hayes for them to copy so there was 36 machines copying one tape one um, master tape well um, so that was all done at, uh, what tape speed was that, would that have been at? Was that seven and a half ips in real time? So, mm, yeah. So, or were Cause, they? Because most machines, domestic machines were seven and a half. Right. Or three and three, three quarters. But I was just wondering with the trend. 15 was the uh, classic, was the uh, professional right. speed. 
Um, yeah, the, the main master tape may have been 15 inch, but everything can be slowed down right. when wanted. Incredible. So 36 of those, two, two years working at Hayes. How, what was the transition to Abbey Road in 1970? You, uh, you wanted to come into the recording side of it or? No, no. Um, my engine, my, uh, boss at, uh, Hayes, he said he'd heard that Len Page was about to retire and he said there might be an opportunity for me. So I said, okay. So I got sent up to Abbey Road and had an interview and got the job to help an assistant to Len Page, who didn't retire for another three or four years. Did you take his job? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Uh, another job came along. Um, Ken Townsend was our boss at, now at that time, and um, things technical were getting out of hand. We had a lot of uh, obviously microphones and tape machines, about 80 master tape machines, and the cutting lathes, of course, and they wanted someone specialist. So they asked uh, several people. One person um, said he would look after all the tape machines. Another person wanted um, a job abroad with the TG desk, our recording desks, um, were sent all over the world. And uh, if they had trouble, the, these people would go out there and sort it. So that was another. And they wanted someone to look after the microphones. So I volunteered for that because I'd never heard of um, or never seen or never experienced the microphone. Uh, and that's how that started. Another engineer um, were busy fixing the, the um, desks. And uh, that was about it. So I never looked back since those days. What was your training in, in microphones, or was it a sort of learn-as-you-earn situation, or like learn how to do well, it? Well, there was no one there to, mm -hmm. to tell me, and I did it by, um, if you plug in enough microphones and take a, ra a, a study of the out, their outputs and their noises, um, that gives you a clue of what's right and what's wrong. And then when it's wrong, um, you've got to find out what's making it wrong. <laughs> so that was all uh, I, I had to teach myself that. Um, what, what, what is your job description here? Apart from Mike Expert. Uh, technical engineer. Technical engineer. Yes. So it's not just microphones, you... you well, uh, I sort of started off in... a bit different. I started off with the cutting equipment, the cutting lathes. Neumann, made by Neumann, cutting lathes up in the cutting rooms, or mastering rooms, we call it now, call them. And uh, I was under the control of chief engineer and a senior engineer. And who, was me. The, who was the chief en engineer and senior engineer when you started? Mike Batchelor and um, Len Page. And they were up in the top room at the end of the corridor, um, room five, uh, which was his office and a uh, technical room with all sorts of technical stuff in. Even an early cutting lathe, a scully, which um, because it was being replaced by a Neumann, uh, Len Page decided to have it moved into his room <laughs> rather than junk it. Yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah. It's not there now, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was some 50 years ago. Uh, so I have, a, I have a note here saying that you had a unique way of testing mics with a white noise amp and ANSL. Well, fortunately, uh, EMI invented a noise gun. Okay. And the noise gang had, gun had a trigger and a output speaker and a, a length of um, nine inches long, which I could stick on the microphone, press the trigger, 
and white noise sound came out of the speaker. It also had a meter, so I knew that it was always the same level coming out of the speaker. I see. And then uh, the micro I could measure what the output of the microphone was in another meter. <laughs> uh, I see. And, and that's, the, that's how we do it today. I was doing it a lot this morning. Oh, I see. <laughs> and you had a soundproofed box to hear the noise of a... Uh... Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the, the gun, there was only three of them made because we had an outside t recording team. And when they went to Vienna and Philadelphia or any studio abroad, they wanted to check their microphones. So they wanted one of these guns. And then there's the third gun. So they only made three of these. The soundproof box mm -hmm. um, I've got under my desk. Oh, you do? Yeah, so I can t dump the uh, microphone live in the box. And I've got an amplifier and I can turn it up as loud as I can. And the box locks down with tightly the lid. And I can turn up and listen to what the, what's happening inside the microphone. Transistors, uh, tra for instance, give uh, not very loud unless they're wrong. They're, they're just a gentle sound come out of those. Uh, a valve microphone gives out more than that. So I measure, take all these measurements and I've got a book about that thick with all the outputs and uh, noises that the microphones make. I've also got the book, the instruction book of the making of this box because everything Ian Bain made, they always had a, a green folder with what it is about because they, they're very professional people, the people who in the EMI department. Treat me like an idiot, because I am. Um, when you say you're listening to the microphone, like yes. the transistors of the microphone, yes. the tube of the, the valve of the microphone, yeah. how, how do you mean you're listening, you're hearing subtle changes in the response of the well, microphone and attributing? I'm not hearing anything, because the quieter right. they are, the better. Right. And I'm listening on a uh, machine um, that I helped design so you could plug in any microphone because yeah. phantom power um, comes into this because many of the mics are phantom powered. So I need to have that. And uh, the microphones that use a power supply um, also um, useful to get uh, a cable into the soundproof box with a valve microphone on the end of it. I'm, I'm intrigued to how you're, how you're listening. Yeah. And this box has uh, various switches on it. Um, the main one is uh, I can turn up the amplifier in the box, from the box. There are two controls, so I can hear it at maximum volume. And I've got a standard reading of, uh, the best reading is about minus 112 dB, which is very quiet, very quiet. So this is the self noise of the microphone? Yes. I see. Do you still have the Western Electric CT? The one that was used, was why the um, EMI HB1Bs were built to replace those? I'd read, maybe I'm wrong, that those were, the American ones were quite expensive. And so... You're going back to the Elgar. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, you know where I'm going. There were three uh, of those uh, American microphones. Right, and that was the first Elgar recordings that were yes, done here. Yes, But they were considered expensive, so that was one of... Well, they never sold their product. Oh, I we see. We had to hire them. Ah. And when you hire something, um, you don't want to pay forever and ever. So uh, that's possibly where um, Bloomline came in to help uh, solve these, in that, you know, these problems of having a, uh, someone else's microphone. So Alan Bloomline was like the chief designer or engineer between, behind the EMI HB1B? Yes. So who was, who was Holman, who yes. invented the mics he with He was the engineer Bloomline? right? who made the, from the designs of... Um, Alan Bloomline was a genius designer. Uh, Herbert Holman was the engineer who would build it. 
So they could go through various um, stages. They could build one and it's not quite right. That's why there's an A, B, C. So the final one, I think it took about a year to perfect. That's when it went onto the market. Uh, Crystal Palace, um, BBC used them because um, they were the best uh, dynamic microphone uh, around at that time. And this was, what, th early 30s? Yes. And that led to Alan Blumlein and stereo recording because he, the story is he took his wife to the cinema and they saw a film and obviously the film's on a big screen and in the middle of the screen behind is where the sounds come out. And he said to his wife, I can make those people come out over there and they can run across the screen and come back there. And he, he got the perception of doing something that uh, is realistic, not just the image, Im one single image making a noise or doing something. So uh, he, we have actually got about 44, 78 discs of his experiments in our archive of, of people running about. And we've even got films of um, a fire engine running round uh, out at Hayes. There was a lot of green lawn. Uh, fire engines ringing their bells. And uh, we've got about five films of different things and people walking across a stage talking as they go just to make uh you know it it certain that this is stereo they didn't call it stereo binaural at that time and uh he was a genius this uh alan i'm still talking to his son his son uh simon is alive and uh I meant to ring him <laughs> sooner or later. Uh, that, that's interesting. So with the, the binaural recording he yes, was doing, it, yes. it was true stereo, so it showed panning. So how were the microphones positioned when recording? That's more difficult because there weren't that many microphones at all. And uh, I'm not sure. Is it what we now call the bloom line where it is two microphones sitting like this on top of each other? That was uh, one way, yes. Right. Oh, I see. I hadn't thought about that. So the HB is actually named after... Yes, Holman. Holman, Holman. And, and Blumlein. Yeah, because Blumlein was not wanting to be... You know, he was so generous. Hmm. He didn't want to, everything to be called under his name. So he. that's why it's HB. He put himself second. Incredible. Because obviously he was the genius designing and Holman was the genius manufacturing, knowing how to manufacture what uh, Alan wanted. Can you give me any of the history of the King's microphones, um, which were custom built for the royal family during the 20s and the 30s? Yeah. Uh, I was very privileged to see them. Wonderful. And get them moved up from archives, who treasured them more than anything, to Abbey Road. Uh, with thanks to Peter Cobbin, who was uh, actively making the film, not actively making it, but recording for the film, uh, The King's Speech. King George VI was an awful stutterer, and this speech was um, able to be made into a film, which was uh, quite a low-budget film. It wasn't, um, you know, super-duper. That depends. Um, so he, Peter knew, because we'd been over some time before to Hayes, where the archive was, and the ar archive was had lots of things on display. It's a bit like a museum, and, you, and it's a shame that it ever disappeared lately. It's, it's gone somewhere and not in show, nothing on show anymore. Mm. But um, the, the land, is, the archive, area had been sold off. He asked, uh, can you send these royal microphones up to Leicester to um, see if he can get any of them to work? 
and because um, they've been lying dormant for at least 50 years, they were locked in the cupboard for 50 years and never used after this, after about 1947. Um, and, the, and when the speeches came, that was they were put away. Um, because they're very, uh, each one was unique. Uh, they were specially made and unusual and uh, quite stunning because they were housed in silver with all the symbols of uh, royalty uh, impressed in the silver and the name is King George V is the earliest one and Queen Mary his wife and then King George VI and then Queen Elizabeth not uh, the royal mother Queen Elizabeth the mother of Queen Elizabeth Second. The Queen Mother. The Queen Mother. Yes. Out of the five, I could uh, get three working. And two of them were carbon granule microphones. And uh, another two were um, moving coil. But um, they were in silver and they were on a stand and one of the nuts and bolts came out of the stand, so I had to open it, it's my excuse, and see inside. <laughs> and uh, the inside was very unusual. It was more like a, um, a diaphragm, which most uh, dynamic microphones are, and it had a triangular um, stem uh, into the center of the uh, ma magnet Th that was quite unique at that time. It was designed in 1937, and I've never heard of another one since. There were these two um, of that type, but I've never, I've never seen uh, another one. So it was a, a unique design. It may have been from Blumlein's ideas, or okay. I don't know. That's what I was wondering, whether they were yes. from Alan Blumlein. So, Sorry to reiterate. What was it? It was a it was a dynamic microphone that you ended up using. We used there were two mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, and there was one. Um, King George V had carbon granules. That okay. was a very early. Uh, they used those telephone carbon granules back in the nineteen hundreds. Telephones with carbon granule mouthpiece. What I discovered with those was uh, they, they, they rattled when you shook them and they had a quite a noise, uh, a loud noise ratio and they needed a battery source to make them work. So I set up a nine volt battery with a switch on it and it would only work when they threw the switch and you'd always hear, you'd, you'd hear the sound you wanted, but you also got this sort of granular sound in the background, which made them not very desirable for future use, but um, we couldn't help it. We had to use that way. And uh, the... But lends some authenticity to... Uh, yeah, to yeah. the soundtrack. Yeah, to use an, the fact, actual mic. And, and we put these three microphones out front of the orchestra so that the orchestras could see them the the members of the orchestra and uh in and the um as i said it was quite a low budget film so the uh tom so it was his movie tom hooper's and uh we had all these mics on show really as a for the people the orchestra to see which was the pleasant and peter told me he started off the music right at the beginning with just those three microphones. And then he slowly brought up the rest of the orchestra. So you've got that on the front of your DVD, or mm. CD rather. There's some interesting mic choices. Oh, we were talking about this earlier with like Jeff Emmerich saying that one of the main reasons why he used the D19 was because it was basically could record anything. It was a dynamic mic. It's, yeah. um, and it was always plugged in, he said. <laughs> um, 
but it's obviously with the connotation of Abbey Road and the Beatles using it, of course, now it's become an incredibly valuable microphone. Is it something you consider to be very durable? Um, it's very fragile. Mm. And uh, we had quite a lot. So I've got a record of uh, nearly 30 of them in uh, my record book. Not that was before I, my record book. It was uh, someone else's record book. <laughs> and uh, there was only about six or seven left when I started. So they were easily used. And now? Uh, and now um, we only had one or two. But um, recently, I bought some second-hand ones, and we've got, uh, it was a swap I did, and everyone agreed to it. I mean, technical, um, my manager agreed to the swap. <laughs> and uh, we got about um, another eight. But they've all got slightly different uh, uh, differences, these uh, D19s, because there was a variant, there was many options in the making of them. And unfortunately, uh, AKG, the Austrian company, made them. But I feel that they couldn't make any more because we wanted more because they were so difficult to make. Because if you measure, which I did, um, the coil, and the coil is that takes the sound uh, through and the magnet amplifies the sound, um, the, the coil was so thin, so fine, finer than the finest hair, um, it, it must have been very hard to manufacture. So I think 8kg pulled out of it and made some other microphones instead. A 19D, 190, 8kg 190, which isn't as good. Wow. What, what, what do you feel like the characteristics of the, of the D19 that make it so special? Apart from it. Well, it worked every time you used it. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't here when the Beatles were using it. But, um, yeah, it was a very popular microphone. It was always uh, on hands and, uh, yeah, good sounding. Yep. I, I think it was quite remarkable when you first find out that it was like an overhead on, on, on drums, you know, which, oh, right. yes. which you would never think of, obviously, for a... A, a, a non-condenser for a dynamic microphone. We were talking, um, but we didn't get to look at, of course, the ball and biscuit. We generally didn't use them for normal recording. Mm -hmm. What every room in the building had was a one hanging down from the ceiling above the work boy, usually working in that room. Uh, to And the idea was to get the same levels out of every recording. So they knew the, um, they always ran a 1K tone on their tape machine. These are the copy rooms, I mean. And uh, you need to get the right level, the same level, which was always 0 dB, out of every time you run the one kilohertz tape. And that uh, ball and biscuit, would give that measurement on the meters. I see. So um, the chief engineer at that time, they were very... Authoritative. Authoritative. Yep. yep. And uh, you had to do everything proper. So every room had to measure like that. And when you're cutting a record, um, it's always got to be the right frequencies to cut at and the right depth of everything. That's where I came in, trying doing uh, cuts what we called um, every morning we did a the engine cutting engineer did a cut of different frequencies so just touching on that for a second uh, the sort of authoritative part of it now 1970s probably kind of that pivotal time isn't it because you've got the, the 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 sort of famous engineers that were the Jeff Emmerichs the Alan Parsons that were all leaving to go off and become very successful engineers and producers in their own right. Was there still at Abbey Road at that period in 1970 a sort of a, a lab coat what kind of mentality uh, that, that persisted? What, what, you, were, you were sort of right at the pivotal moment, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, uh, the lab coat 
white lab coat was hanging behind the door <laughs> of Len Page's. That's where I was. Right. And it was always hanging there. It was never taken off the door. <clears throat> so, um, yes, it, you've got photographs of uh, engineers with white leg lab coats and the sweeper-uppers had brown lab coats, or not lab coats, brown, which differentiated the people from each other. <laughs> but that was sort of like, you were at the sort of tail end of that uh, yes, yeah. uh, regime? <laughs> I, I, when, when he retired, I took my white coat home and worked under my car with it. <laughs> Changing the oil and such like. <laughs> I wish I hadn't, because it would have been quite a symbol today. That's uh, that's one heck of a collection of U87s there. That's right. A collection of them. Uh, these we bought about 40 years ago, and these were a new edition, uh, slightly louder microphones uh, we bought about 30 years ago. And these were the first uh, Neumann made in Berlin microphones. of two different types. This is a um, valve microphone, which is a condenser, they're condenser microphones, you see. They've got uh, gold diaphragms. And this is a uh, one which gives you three different patterns. You can have, uh, and most condenser microphones which are made have um, the, these uh, symbols on them. So that middle symbol means that the front of the diaphragm is live and gives the highest output. And then you've got that one, which is a circle, which is omni. So it's equal output wherever you stand. And figure of eight is very um, on the front very loud and on the rear very loud, but cancellation in between. And back in the 50s and 60s in America, duets singing side by side, or one in front of the other, was very popular. And this was um, made, uh, invented by Neumann, the figure of eight, we call it, because it looks like a figure of eight. Now with the, the U forty sevens, didn't yes. didn't Abbey Road um have those modded to be U forty eights? So for the same reason, so that you could sing on both sides. That's uh the forty seven was sold as a it's just a cardioid mm -hmm. because they hadn't uh Neumann hadn't uh, realized the figure of eight. They hadn't uh, thought of that yet. So um, the 48, U48, became um, the one with a cardioid, always a cardioid, because that's the most used. Um, and figure of eight, that's like, uh, this was the reason for the dual singers. I just, I had read, whether it was right or not, I'd read that the, that it was actually Abbey Road that modded their 47s to have the, four, have the uh, figure of eight pattern on it as well. And the idea for Neumann, when they brought out the 48, which gave you cardioid and figure of eight, it was sold in a box with a head of the 47, which gave you o Omni mm -hmm. and, uh, Cardioid. In other words, for, to get the figure of eight, you've got to buy um, three head shells, really, heads. Wow. To interchange. They, 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 people could uh, pull the head off and put on the other head because they hadn't come to uh, how, how to make a um, all-in-one all microphone yet back then in the 55, 56 era and that's when um, they sort of took over the market and uh, invented so many ideas for microphones on microphones. Do we have 47s and 48s here to, to see? 70 years old, we bought them in 54, 53, 54. This came from Olympic when we took over Olympic Studios so we gathered some more microphones. 
They all have a power supply. Every condenser microphone needs a power supply. And that's uh, an example. And there's an example of the pattern. We call it a pattern, cardioid, because it looks like a heart. And the other pattern is figure of eight, being the 48 in a 47 box. Doesn't matter. And uh, inside is a valve which went out of production in 1952 because Neumann, George Neumann, invented a, um, because it was a war, German war, in Germany, with Germany, the uh, metal was very in short demand. So they didn't want to put a, um, a valve that has two features, that is a heater and a anode. The heater makes the cathode uh, project, um, uh, the signals were crossed to the anode because the anode has a high voltage and the, um, the heater has a low voltage. And that, that meant buying a transformer for the power supply with two windings, which they couldn't afford in the war, during the wartime. Metal was short. So um, they invented uh, Telefunken made a valve to suit, which was only one voltage hmm. to work the whole thing. And consequently, uh, and it's unlike any other um, valve, and it became obsolete because it wasn't made anymore. Um, but by the end of 52, 53, it was out of production. So that makes them very valuable today because, as I've said, um, they were such a beautiful microphone and people with them were desperate to get a, a new valve if the valve broke down or like everything, they, they might burn themselves out. So new, new versions appear sometimes on the market and eBay for a fantastic price, like six grand each. Which is a, that's how popular these are today. Still, right. spend a lot of money on them. In in the the first boxes they sold, America was a big uh, selling ground for uh, Neumann. Um, the other position was the Omni, that made both sides and not every side uh, usable, uh, active. So they, you would unscrew those and put on the other head if you <laughs> bought it, this and a, uh, the he another head in the box. That's crazy to think that you used to buy a microphone with the, <laughs> the microphone head. that's now worth about $30,000 used to have two heads. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Everything's crazy. <laughs> Everything's magic, if we could say that. Um, so, uh, you can see how many we've got, how popular they are. We talked about um, 47 and 48, but we didn't bother to differentiate. For the, um, for the setups, we call all these mics 48s, because um, they're, okay, they're going to be used on cardioid only. Hmm. We are hardly ever used on Omni or figure of eight. I see. So uh, when I labelled all these, I said, let's just call them 47. <laughs> Could have right. been. Now the M50s are special, and there's an M49. So you can see the idea of 47, 48, 49, 50. Mm. Neumann were sort of keeping to the year. But when you make so many microphones, you can't keep doing that. So that's when for, uh, other microphone numbers come into play. Anyway, these are very special and very heavy because they've got a transformer power supply and they look very different, quite different. 
um, we put them on something like that so we can hang it. Or, and the power supply cable goes there. And they are always used, mostly used, on the Decker tree, we call it, which is um, in every studio, we've got about 12 foot arrangement with a branch off, uh, two branches on it. So one of these can hang facing the whole orchestra and the room, have you been in the room? Oh, we're Number about one. to, yes. It, it's so vast, it uh, picks up everything. And the side um, branches, uh, it's po pointed left and the other one is, so there's three of these. And um, you won't be able to see this, but the diaphragm in there is, is only half an inch. Oh, really? Yes. Which is different to most other microphones, which are diaphragms of one inch. Um, they were doing, Neumann was leading the world, really, with microphones. And they were doing experiments and they were wondering, what does the orchestra do, uh, produce? And um, can we get a better microphone? And the fact was, yes, we can get a better microphone because this one, half inch diaphragm, um, is engineered to pick up the violin section a little bit above every other instrument I see. to highlight them. And what they did was get a, a perspex ball, really the size of a golf ball, and they put this half inch um, microphone inside this capsule inside the uh, hole driven in this spher spherical perspex and that made all the difference so they they had they experimented with different shapes for quite a, a while they they published um, all these shapes and measured what the outputs from these uh, violins and such like and the result was this uh, type of this size in a ball. So inside that, the head there is a perspex ball and yes. the capsule's inside it. Yes. Oh, I see. That's F for front. That's for our engineers to know. It's a ribbon microphone. It was built by EMI at Hayes, the factory there. It was a big factory. Where well, you used to work before you came to Abbey Road. If we look inside, they, we only made... 36 of these. I've got 35 and number 35, 6. RM1B, ribbon microphone 1B. There was a 1A and there was a 1C, but that's another story. <laughs> that's the diaphragm flapping about. Very powerful horseshoe magnet. Wow. Trans large transformer in the bottom. And that uh, will give whatever sound comes out of the cable and into the dot, into the desk. Now they stopped, this is my conjecture, they stopped um, buying, making these e EMI in about 1949 or 50 because uh, there was another mic uh, ribbon microphone came out on the market. And uh, Merrick will show you. So uh, here we go, BBC patent. So the BBC got in on the act, probably their first. Made in England, Standard and Telephone Cable Company Limited. And this is a very powerful uh, magnet, horseshoe magnet. And again, there's that very fine ribbon inside there, which you can't see because there's a mesh which is like a spit shield, it helps. And here's a an, here's an better looking one, which <laughs> I painted earlier. <laughs> painted black, yeah, painted black. And uh, look at the strength of the power of the magnet. I don't want to let go, but you can tell. Well. 
Do you know Colette used to do this? She used to show people <laughs> and put two microphones together, showing off, <laughs> like me. These are camera cases, so uh, we bought loads of those and they're perfect for what we want. Should be a power supply there. And uh, the microphone, that's the main thing. I won't show you that. <laughs> uh, looks like that. And um, it's got red bippy on it, which distinguishes it from the M50s, which has got a white lozenge or bippy. So it's essentially the same mic as far as the body is concerned. They just went for the smaller capsule, a half inch, because they, like oh. you said, they want to focus on the violins. Yes. Bring the high mids forward, basically. Yes. See some KM53s there? Yeah. They're very popular. Wonderful on acoustic guitars and mandolins and violins. and I, I have a KM53. I do love it. Jolly Dear. good, yes. Yeah. Um, this is extraordinarily heavy. For such a little microphone? Yes. Power supply. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see there's a pair in there, is there? There's a pair. Mm. <laughs> no, it's a feather. But uh, I don't know why it's so heavy. Uh, so the 53, a very special Neumann microphone. Excuse me. So that's an Omni microphone. Beautiful. And uh, probably around that date, 1953. And you like yours too. <laughs> Gorgeous, yeah. Yeah. Uh, th these were those valves that were unique now they look like that which is unlike any other valve ever made oh wow well that's ef12k yeah vf14 is the uh proper one that's the inside Incredible. This one, is this one unused? No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Oh, but you still have the original um, box. Oh yeah, <laughs> they're nice. I, I keep everything original. Soundproof box under here. Oh, here it is. I've got a mic in there. In fact, I'll just, um, plug it in then. <clears throat> so this is the gear <clears throat> and uh, I've left it switched on. And it's a phantom power mic, so I plug in there. That's the sort of noise one gets from not a quite right mic. So then I have to take it apart and find out what's making that noise. It's mostly the transistor or the FET in there. And I have to change that, which is very delicate because it's someone blowing on it. What would you attribute that to? Uh, the FET, the FET noise, yes. <clears throat> and so it gets locked in like this. That was the uh, fault. Windy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and worse. This is very useful for, there are different types of um, connectors. So I can plug in various other connectors and uh, listen to the microphone in the box. I see you've just casually got an Altec laying down there, like uh, one of the yeah. modded, modded EMI ones. Uh, yeah, um, it's something I've got to do in my dotage time. <laughs> um, Len Page, we had lots of these at the mm -hmm. time, and they're very, very good. You you know about them. I do, yes, yes. And um, Len Page tried to improve on it by using a, a light source. And that's what it 
exists in here, but I haven't found out um, how to wire it up because uh, it, it seems to me it never worked. So it's going to be a long story, hold, a long haul to try and make it work. I, I have tried and not succeeded. And there's a measurement. Which is quite good. It's quite high measurement. Right. Unfortunately, it's windy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this was the time from the 50s when they were experimenting with stereo. And there were many ways you could get stereo. Um, you know, there were many variations you might be able to manage and you want the best stereo. So they asked me, can I cut a hole so we can put a KM53 in there and you've got your um, normal uh, microphone inside the M50 of, or 49 inside. So the, um, they're almost touching. The uh, microphone's almost touching. Now, um, that, that's a good experiment. I don't know what came of the experiment, but... Oh, I know how it sounded, yes. I don't know how it sounded. And that was done within my time, because I cut the hole. <laughs> <laughs> so people like Chris Parker and uh, um, several other people in Long Gone Now were experiment still experimenting with stereo. Niall. Niall, Niall Rogers. Rogers. That's it. Niall Rogers. Sorry. That's right. I get that if I'm thinking too, too hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, he came in here. Yeah. And he played, a, he played this. 15 minutes he was in here, aiming it around the room like that and having a f great f field, field day. <laughs> Here's another way, you see, there without the hole. That, that was made specially to, to hold the two microphones. Do you know Wes Dooley? Of course, yes. I know Wes very well. Oh, wow. Brian, K.U.? Yeah. You know them? Of yes. them? Yes. Great friends of mine, Brian and Kevin. I was speaking to Wes and yesterday. And Dave Perlman. Yeah. And of course, Ken Scott. Yeah. Oh, what a, what a, what a wonderful uh, alumni. And he <laughs> uh, made that for me. Oh, lovely. And it's a lamp. It lights up. Oh, it does. <laughs> I, have, I have that very <laughs> microphone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've yeah. got five of them. They're great, aren't they? RCA, uh, yeah. but from the 30s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very useful too. Yeah. I mean, cleaning. How do you clean a, a, a 47 or a 48? The, the capsules. Well, the capsule? Yeah, after all those years. <laughs> I did one today for you somebody. You did one today? Yes. Uh, U67 what's capsule. The, what's the process in cleaning it? <clears throat> well. Painstaking. Um, Werner Vowell was the uh, agent over here for um, for our microphones from Neumann. It was the Neumann, and um, he would come in and uh, get some distilled water, and with a soft brush. He would wash the capsule. He mm -hmm. would wash the diaphragm and uh, dry it on a bit of blotting paper and dry it off. Well, wow. And that's what he used to do. But today, um, someone brought me a microphone with, which was a bit dusty. I just dusted it with this brush because the, um, they're getting old and sometimes the gold surface flakes off. So I didn't want to spoil someone's microphone with that water treatment. Anyhow, I just dusted it, put it all together, 
and he was very pleased with the result because it was quieter. He was making a noise like the whooshing noise at first, but uh, when I'd finished dusting it and put it together, it was quiet. So <laughs> some desperate um, ways of uh, cleaning a microphone that were um, yeah, amazing in the past. Like what? What did people do? Well, <laughs> use water. Uh, use water, right. Yeah, he was, he, Ken, Tell, uh, Ken Scott was here um, about October last year um, for five days doing some Beatles songs, mm -hmm. but not, um, not in the same style of, of, of the way they would sing. So he had a, in number two studio, he had a small orchestra and recording engineers Lovely. and it was Beatley songs but not Beatles <laughs> he came over for a week yeah he's a nice chap get on with him to get on pretty well um, if the wolves could sing is that the one you're going to see <laughs> I, I know of it yes box of U87. They're dummies. Ah. I've taken out the inside because when we have events they we always put up early microphones, I see. tape recorders, things to look at. The but you don't have to worry about them falling over and getting broken. That's correct. Yes that makes sense. <laughs> I can put them back later to yeah. work if we need to work but there's a, a shortage of those valves you see so it's no point having every one working because as they go start going down they won't be able to replace do you have many vf-14s <laughs> um i've got a lot but they don't all work i see i've got this many where is it lester Outro. yes lester thank you ever so much i really appreciate it pleasure meeting you lovely to meet you too do i have to give this back oh yeah you have to no. give it back to that guy 